today. Um, we're here for the Fox Sun virtual tasting of our October wines, our 17 10 o'clock vineyard Chardonnay, the Solomon Hills also from 17 vintage, and our Los Potreros Cabernet from Happy Canyon. Um, so uh, why don't we start off um, now and, and um, um, introduce Billy that everybody knows. And I'm just here as a pretty face. He's just here. Dick, by the way, Dick had surgery on his shoulder yesterday. So he's, he's not uh, drinking or being very coherent. So he's here as an observer. Um, but with that ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Billy and maybe you could tell people about this vintage and harvest and what we experienced in uh, this year. Uh, okay, you know, 2020 has been a really odd, difficult year in every way, uh, in every way imaginable. But the actual, the 2020 vintage on my end, uh, I think that the fruit that we pulled in and the wines so far that we're seeing are an absolute highlight of 2020, the year 2020. Uh, just phenomenal. And they're really going to be, uh, if we all get through this, uh, they're really going to be something to look forward to uh, for 2020 uh, because it's going to give us something pleasant uh, as a reminder of 2020. <laughs> uh, granted, the, uh, you know, the vintages are getting more difficult and more difficult with global warming. And it's a real battle these days to uh, just to, you know, to keep that romance of farming and romance of winemaking going uh, because climate change is really sucking, sucking the romance out of farming and out of uh, winemaking. And you really got to kind of, oh, just, just try to stay on top of it as much as you can and uh, not let it bother you too much. Uh, so the 2020 vintage was a roller coaster. You know, we had three different unique heat waves. Uh, one in August that hurt us more than the September uh, heat wave. By uh, We had serious burn in, in a lot of our uh, uh, vineyard on the canyon floor that we had to address. Uh, it just got too hot at that time. And then the September heat wave, we actually had 120 degrees Fahrenheit in San Inez Valley here that one day. And you just couldn't do anything. We couldn't do anything. But anyway, we're really happy about the 2020 vintage. Yields seem to be normal. Uh, uh, Pinot Noir in the Santa Maria Valley normal to maybe a little bit uh, more than normal. And we were really happy about that. Uh, Santa Rita Hills picked a little light, uh, Happy Canyon picked a little light. And then the Los Olivos district and Fox and Canyon where we sourced most of our Rhone varietals, kind of medium uh, yields. But I, I, I just, and uh, saying this for David too, that we're both really, really happy about 2020 harvest. So uh, it's really worked out uh, with these weather extremes. <laughs> on the positive side, what are your standouts in terms of your stars from, from this vintage that you were maybe surprised about? Uh, I, think, I think all the whites are like uh, stellar. Uh, Pinot Noirs, I think, with the the some of the stuff we picked off of John Sebastiano, Faciega, and Long Cantata are absolutely really uh, delicious right now and awesome, and uh, and they all have this incredible backbone. Uh, Santa Maria Valley, where yields were a little bit higher, I think it's going to be. Uh, very refreshing, uh, uh, approachable wines on the early end. Uh, 
So as far and, as the, the and, and our Happy Canyon wines uh, with the 7200 label, just really off the chart, uh, delicious. Uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun to put those blends together. It was an, it's an amber alert, everybody. So we're, we're okay. Sorry, sorry about that, Bill. Um, <laughs> but so really I was going to ask you, with you know, because you brought up uh, the global warming, climate change issues that you're dealing with, um, two two questions. Um, how did that affect uh, this year with the timing in terms of the uh, when harvest started? And, and then the second part of that, the question is, what are you doing differently now in, in light of the climate challenges that we're, that we're facing more recently? Um, what are you doing in terms of mitigating or changing your farm? Uh, I think number one is we're, we're paying much, much more attention to the weather <laughs> on a, like uh, three times a day uh, during harvest and before harvest, uh, kind of on a long range deal. Uh, but, you know, we've got two issues uh, that are big as far as wine growing and wine making these days. And that's number one is the climatical deal. And number two is fires. And uh, the whole fire deal, you know, 10 years ago, you would have never thought that this was going to be a problem in winemaking, but it really has become uh, this probably the number one issue with wine growing and winemaking now in California. Uh, we were really lucky this year. We seemed to, Santa Barbara County seemed to be an island in a sea of, of wildfire, and we actually had no smoke issues in Santa Barbara County. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of Northern California did, uh, and it's really sad on for them. Uh, we did have high atmospheric smoke, but that that's not an issue. Uh, the issue is always when the smoke is on the ground or you have ash in the air settling on the berries. And uh, we were really lucky to have gotten through this vintage without any serious fire effects. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it did seem like we were the only place that wasn't on fire during harvest. I, mean, the, I think the only effect we had was the uh, the sugars weren't moving because we had high smoke and we weren't getting sunshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe you could address that. I mean, what happens to the vines when the temperatures go to 100? Oh, you know what? This is getting so hard on the vines when you get these heat waves uh, that go up to 115, 120 degrees because they don't they don't want to work in that weather. Uh, they don't want to work in that heat. So they just essentially just shut down. But at the same time, they're dehydrating. And, uh, you know, a grape can only make sugar to some point, and then once they get to that point, they make sugar by dehydration or raisining, you could call it, and and that's not a good thing. So it's really important to hit your picking date when they're still making sugar and not making sugar from dehydration. And I think we were, David and I were really good about that this year on hitting our targets. Uh, Granted, we we tend to pick a little bit earlier these days because we're so gun shy about these heat waves. Because <laughs> uh, you don't want to be almost there and then get a three or four day heat wave and then miss your opportunity. Uh, I'd yeah. rather pick a little bit on the early side than on the late side, especially with being on noir. Uh, exactly. And on that note, I'd like to move into our. 17 Chardonnay Tinnacock Vineyard, which is the first offering in this wine club shipment. Uh, before we start here, people are going to be able to ask questions, so you can do that on the Q&A side. So feel free to ask your questions um, to Billy, um, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Okay, Bill. 
going back to uh, heat during harvest time, the heart, the Tinnacock Vineyard, these vines were planted in 1989 and Dick and I planted them really deep. We were, these were sticks planted about three, three and a half feet deep with a, with a rock bar. Uh, and because of that, the roots are very deep at this age of these vines and they seem to weather these heat waves very easily. I mean, it's amazing that you think you're gonna go get up to the vineyard after two days of 115 degrees and, and see disaster. And you really don't. They just, they just are real nonchalant about this heat and they're able to withstand it. And uh, we, we sell a little bit of this fruit to a few people and uh, it's blown them away that they, they're calling me and calling me, hey, what are we gonna do? It's so hot and what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? I go, be patient, be, they'll, they'll be fine. And the Tinnacock Vineyard is that, is that it can, it can yeah. roll through these heat waves for some not, reason, a little bit of magic maybe. Uh, we're not a, a able to add water, so they, they still seem to fare well because, yeah, because my farm. They do. Uh, they just seem to be in their own little pattern. Uh, but this is the Tinnacock Vineyard uh, 2017 Chardonnay. And 17 was a really mild growing season. And we didn't have any weather ups and downs until Labor Day weekend. And Labor Day weekend, the it was just off the chart. I think we hit 117 degrees and uh, but this vineyard pulled through that pretty easily and uh this is a beautiful this is probably one of the most pretty uh drop dead chardonnays we've ever picked off this estate and uh i've shown it a few uh tastings and everybody has really loved it and uh, it's it's our style which is uh, non malolactic uh, fermented in big 500 liter punchins, not a lot of new, usually 20 to 25 percent new. And it's just a touch of oak, and I, I like that. And uh, of course, no malolactic because we like that acidity. Uh, I, I'm a believer in, I'm a believer in firm uh, acidities in my Chardonnays because they're much better food wines. Uh, there's a good question here from uh, Steve Medbury. Uh, what temperature do you recommend serving this Chardonnay at? Which is really good. Uh, I think because pull, I people pull it out of the pull it out of the refrigerator a half an hour before you want to open it. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't have to be. It shouldn't be ice cold. No, it should be uh, just below room temperature. Yeah, yeah. I like uh, it. Shows it shows very well. Yeah. All right. And of course, Scott Olson says, go Dar Dodgers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a good question, because I think most people serve Chardonnay to the too Tennessee. Cold. Too cold. And how about um, Catherine Bush would like to know about uh, food pairings? Okay. So my favorite with this Chardonnay is that we have a tendency to release it uh, late summer early fall and the Santa Barbara Channel spiny lobster season opens the first Wednesday of October every year and this is a phenomenal matchup with that with lobster uh, uh, just you know a uh, just a lobster roll uh, but also I'm fascinated with this wine with all uh, you know Believe it or not, with cream corn. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's got if these. If you can do, you know, if you can roast some corn and then cream it and do it with some local halibut, it's just this awesome combination uh, between the texture of the halibut and the sweetness of the cream corn. It just does wonders with this wine. All right, we have. I have a very important uh, request from John Snyder. Since they're taping the Dodger game, please don't uh, give away the ending. 
Okay. Um, All right. Uh, Done. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I love I love this wine with just about any oily fish from cod to halibut. Um, you know, rich lobster with some butter and lemon is just to die for. Um, but it, it does it, well with uh, it does well with miso too. So miso black cod uh, black cod is really uh, yeah. uh, good right now in Santa Barbara. Uh, I don't know if you can. Uh, get it elsewhere in the world but uh the miso black cod is really good um scott's got another really good question here does the extreme heat spikes that we experience this fall uh, late summer into fall will there be does that impact um next year's um vintage at all uh no unless unless we get a uh, drastic unless we're deficit uh, in the root zone, as, as far as moisture goes and we get a lot of early leaf drop, yes, it will. But for the most part, if the vines are healthy and we've had a good run through the growing season of normal weather, uh, we're, we're okay. Yeah, well, and Mickey's made a good point here and this is a great pairing. He's enjoying it now with uh, crab cakes. Oh, yes. Yeah, good choice. Yeah, and I think the acidity on this the 17, 10 o'clock, I think is one of the juiciest and, and nicely balanced Chardonnays. I think one of my favorites in the last 10 years. One of the things that we have to decide when it's in the barrel and once it's done fermenting and we go in and about taste taste it and evaluate it, uh, is we have to decide if it's post-fermentation, if it's a little lean or a little fat. And if it's a little lean, like we found in, in the 2019 vintage, big high acidities on all the whites, then we'll do some lee stirring in the barrels two, three times maybe. And that, that really helped us out with the, the uh, 19, vintage of whites. Uh, this, the 17 vintage, we really didn't have to do anything. We did no lee stirring uh, or batonage, if you want to call it that, uh, because it was good from the get-go. Uh, and it's got, it's got really nice texture, and it's definitely not a butterball, uh, which I detest. Uh, so, so was the reason that you're using the, the bigger barrels? for this in particular? Because you get more fruit to, uh, a, a greater fruit to oak ratio than an oak to fruit ratio. Yeah, so they're, all right. They're, they're two and a third size bigger than a regular barrel. All right, um, and uh, thank you, Steve. We've got another really good question. If we were comparing this particular Chardonnay to a white Burgundy, which region would, would you say it's closest to? Oh, For that uh, I, I hate to make the comparison, yeah. but uh, I think definitely Cote de Bone, maybe somewhere between Merceau and, and one of the uh, Montrachets. Yeah. But, but not, but the, not that intense because of, we're not Burgundy. Yeah, yeah, I'm. <laughs> we're, I'm not, we're not farming fifty-year-old vines. These are well, these are twenty, what, eighty-nine, thirty, thirty-year-old. So we're getting there. We're, we're getting there. I think the. But for me, out of our Chardonnays, the Tinnacock has. If we were to liken it to a white Burgundy, I would say it has the minerality. Um, that yes, it's got that. It's got that really nice kind of uh, flinty, slaty uh, stuff going on uh, in the in the aromas, and I I really like that. And I I think that is uh, vineyard uh, derived from the Monterey Shale uh, and those roots being so deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions out there, people? Um, 
Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, Solomon Hills Pinot Noir. All right, I'm pouring it. So you you got to understand about Solomon Hills is that it's kind of like going to this vineyard in the sand dunes like out by Oso Flaco. <laughs> if anybody knows where that is. Uh, it's just a little uh, kind of bizarre to go in there because it's like walking on beach sand and uh, it's usually foggy, really foggy in the morning and or if you're out there in the afternoon the wind's blowing really hard. Uh, so Billy, can you um, describe, because we're showing the AVA map from Santa Maria Valley, so that people can orient themselves? Okay, if they can see where Bienacito is, you can see that Solomon Hills is approximately, uh, one, two, probably about five or five miles, I would say, from uh Bien Nacido. Mm -hmm. and so that five miles is a big deal because that means five to six uh degrees temperature difference on a daily basis so five degrees cooler and uh that's a big deal uh if you're 75 degrees instead of 80 degrees uh that's going to make a big difference and our Solomon Hills fruit is always has this sense of elegance that uh, we don't get or we get less at Biennacito. Biennacito has got these nice clay soils and uh, the fruit off of block eight and uh, also off of block 43 or uh, the fruits a little denser, uh, a little more uh, tannins, not that it's going to have a lot of tannins, but definitely more than Solomon Hills. And these, these Solomon Hills Pinot Noirs are kind of always fresh and kind of agreeable and, and approachable sooner than, say, our Bienacito Pinot Noirs. Very, it's a very pretty, um, with uh, pink, very soft tannins. Um, you know, really nice red red fruit, uh, kind of strawberries that uh, surrounded by a lot of strawberry fields there. Right, uh, strawberries and blueberries. Uh, yeah. This is also you always off of Solomon Hills, whether it's a, one of our Pinot Noirs or uh, some of our local producers Chardonnays off that site. Uh, you always get this kind of. Uh, kind of saline tide water deal going so it's a little bit salty and mm -hmm. it really is fun uh, when you're uh, matching it up with certain food and my favorite to me, I remember when I was up at the Pinnacles farming at Shalong uh, everybody used to go over to this Chinese restaurant in Hanford so all these all these people in the Salinas Valley at Shalone and also up at uh, Mount Eden that we were associated with and uh, everybody would go over to this Chinese restaurant in Hanford and take Pinot Noir <laughs> over and Dick Graff got me into that and it's really really good with uh, uh, Beijing cuisine or what used to be called Mandarin cuisine so kind of mild Chinese uh, yeah, food like you know the the pancakes and the uh the egg foo young and the chow mein and it's just kind of all over that and i really really like that marriage Dick's, Dick's yelling in mushu pork hey, yeah so mushu pork uh, peking duck yes we have a really good question from doug white that was specifically addressed to the chardonnay but i think you could address both the I, chardonnay yeah, and yeah. the peanut. Um, but how how do you try to shape the wine, or do the grapes define the final finish? We, as as wine growers, we try to set that fruit up. So we really 
don't have to do much on the crush pad or in the cellar. Uh, part of that's uh, picking at optimum ripeness. Uh, but I call myself a wine grower. You try to set it up so you really don't have, all you have to do is babysit this thing through its, uh, through its cellar life. And uh, it's, it's never fun when you have to uh, kind of work with a wine to make it different. And we, I mean, we work our hardest in the field to try to avoid that situation. Yeah. I, um, we, I, my, one of my favorite um, uh, times of the year is always when we sit down, um, you, Dick, me, David, um, and whoever else, um, sit down and taste all the single vineyard Pinots that have just been bottled. And I'm always amazed that they have, there's a, dis, despite the vintage, the distinct personality of the vintage comes through year after year, which to me is everything. Um, I think with Pinot Noir, especially, you, you want to kind of protect the site. Uh, you, you, want, you want each individual Pinot Noir off that individual site to show the site uh, and the vintage, of course. Uh, so granted, the vintage is gonna be the variable, but mm -hmm. the site is generally gonna be uh, non-variable. And uh, I, this 17 Solomon is, I think is, is a perfect example of that. Uh, yeah. Um, Dick, Dick, um, we don't, we don't want to give away the game. Um, so I have a really good uh, question. We have a really good question here from Joel and Susan. Um, how do the, in comparing the Santa Rita Hills Pinos this year um, versus the Santa Maria Valley, what are the differences that you're seeing in the grapes that we've got? Well, so far? you know, I hate to. Uh, make it a trophy chase every year because everybody you know there seems to be uh always santa maria versus santa rita and i love them both for what they are yeah. uh they're both uh different in their really really good ways and uh but this year i think santa rita won just because of the intensity of the fruit and the low yields, mm -hmm. and I think we nailed our picks there. You know, we picked less in Santa Rita than we do in Santa Maria, and so we have less picks, so we seem to kind of have this uh, more of a focus because we're getting less, actually. But I think that our 2020 John Sebastiano Vineyard could be historic and it might be the best ever. Wow. That's my gut feeling right now uh, because we were completely blown away from day one when the, all of those picks came in. It, we were just kind of blown away. Uh, could not believe it. And then the same thing with Juan Cantata and the same thing with Faciega. Mm -hmm. And uh, not that we were bored with all of our picks in Santa Maria, but uh, they just stood out a little more than, uh, although a couple of our block eight picks were right there too. So, yeah. yeah. That's, a good, that's a good problem um, to decide. Yeah. So I've got two very different questions that I'm going to ask you, Billy. Um, th they're really good. So Catherine Bush has a question that I think a lot of people have, is how has the pandemic influenced field work? Um, and did it affect the harvest process this year? It affected, it actually affected the whole growing season. Uh, vineyards had a really tough time keeping crews together because if one guy goes down, uh, the rest of the crew has to go down. And so there was a lot of uh, non-intentional neglect in the vineyards this year where things couldn't be done in a timely manner or a timely basis. And uh, 
you certainly saw that everywhere. And you just kind of had to have the mindset to just roll with that and realize what was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd get pissed off at the same time, but you had to kind of let it go that things weren't getting done in a timely fashion. And uh, that's hard. I'm for so happy. I'm just so happy with the way the fruit came in. Uh, having worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Steve's got a good question here that I, maybe you can kind of address how you choose the blocks that we work with and the clones that we work with. He wants to know which clones, how do you decide which clones to use in a particular block, you know, from a particular block? How do you, um, well, how do you, you, know, you, you start with, you start with all of them and after many, uh, seasons and many harvests you start finding some favorites in certain sites uh, so this and one of the things that we're finding it you know we had this wave of Dijon clones that came in in the uh, 80s and that that was the hot stuff and we're kind of rolling back into some of the older clones right now. Uh, Pomard, uh, you know, we, we got so excited about all these new fancy clones that we forgot about Pomard and Pomard is a beautiful clone of Pinot Noir mm -hmm. and is really good. And it seems to be a better clone uh, because it doesn't have the morphology that some of these Dijon clones have in very small clusters and very small berries that suffer more in these heat events than the pomard does. And so pomard kind of retains this uh, fruit element that uh, maybe we lose in that heat with the Dijon clones. And, yeah. and then it varies site to site. Uh, All right. Well, so things, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, which is an, it's an ongoing thing for you, right, Bill? I mean, it in is. terms of- It is. Uh, we, can, uh, we can have a favorite clone off block eight in one year, and then it'll be a dog the next year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sort, of, sort of like our kids. I yeah, mean, get, right. Uh, so uh, Mickey's got, and I've got a question for you from Mickey and a question that I'll address from Leslie. So we'll start with Mickey's here. Um, in Santa Rita Hills, um, is that in part because Santa Rita Hills has a better ocean breeze? It does not have a better ocean breeze. Santa Maria Valley has a much better ocean breeze and that's why it's, Santa Maria is wide open to the ocean and Santa Rita is not. Santa Rita has all these nooks and crannies that maybe wind is less of an issue. Uh, uh, Santa Maria, definitely cooler. Yeah. And uh, but because of that, Santa Maria has warmer winters than Santa Rita, but also earlier bud break and also longer hang time than Santa Rita. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, a good, that's a good point because I think there's a lot of perception that somehow Santa Rita Hills is cooler, windier, whatever, and, and I think that's a miss. They, they're just, they're different. Um, but one is not necessarily colder than the other. Right. Um, but Leslie's got a good question here, and I'll, I'll do my best to, to address it. Uh, general question, with so many wines in production, how do we pick what goes in club shipments for a given period, and how far in advance do you choose? Um, <laughs> And I would say, well, number one, we got to make, it has to be of a certain number. So um, if we make a, we have a few wines that we make only a hundred cases or 200 cases, and that's not enough. Um, and we try to spread out the Pinots as best we can. And, um, and because Mill Billy makes so many different wines, we're just trying to balance the, the shipments and, and do what people, give people what they want. So hopefully, 
um, you're happy with that. But we do try to plan at least a year, at least a year out. And some years we've we've had to make some adjustments. But uh, by and large, it it is a lot of planning. And I don't know if Katie is listening in, our wine club manager, but she does an outstanding job of doing uh, so much of that planning for us. Yeah, my my take is that. I want the wines that go out in the shipment to be at their absolute best when they go out. And I think we've been pretty good about that. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think right. this one here, these wines here, uh, I mean, you could open them tonight or you could put them away and they'll be fine. Uh, I think in my tasting notes, I, I give you kind of a, a window of when to open it and enjoy it. Uh, like the Chardonnay, I said through 2024, I think that's spot on. Uh, 2028 for the Solomon Hills Pinot. Uh, and then our next wine, the Cabernet Sauvignon Los Petreros, 2030. Yeah. And uh, we, we, we've had, an, we've been making wine long enough, so it's pretty, easy to dial in these these windows uh, because of our library and opening up these older vines and uh, and going oh wow yeah that's that's good yeah yeah all right i don't think i have any more questions so this uh i want to go get some chinese takeout right now <laughs> i was thinking <laughs> um Okay, um, someone says, were the comments about Santa, uh, Santa Maria Valley were greater yields than the Santa Rita Hills? This uh, year. Greater uh, versus the, this year. Yeah. yeah, and you know, maybe a lot of reasons for that is maybe our warmer winter and spring in Santa Maria, uh, and maybe a kind of a better, milder, uh, you know, Santa Maria, you get a lot of, Santa Rita, you get a lot of ups and downs. And Santa Maria, it's that, those curves are a little more level. Uh, so maybe it was just ready, the uh, Santa Maria Valley vines were just ready to, uh, but it wasn't the case with all of uh, the Santa Maria Valley fruit. Uh, it was mostly just uh, Pinot Noir was normal. Yeah. You know, Santa Rita was not normal. Santa Rita was light, so yeah, so uh, it's, it's nice to be normal. <laughs> and well, in the Santa Rita Hills, you've got some different microclimates within Santa Rita Hills, correct? Yes. Yeah. So the different, and different, different situations, you know. Here's Long Cantata that faces north, uh, Faciega that faces south, uh, and John Sebastiano that faces all different directions. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that would account for the differences in the Santa Rita Hills uh, Pinots that we make. Yeah. Yeah. And we, you know, uh, going back to John Sebastiano, there was a early summer fire in uh, the Santa Rita Hills around and through John Sebastiano Vineyard. And it was too early to have any smoke taint issues because smoke taint has to happen when the grape starts turning color and beyond when they're respiring a lot and and sucking in those smoke compounds and it was way too early but what happened was it burned up some of the vineyard <laughs> and so we and they also they also had uh uh fire uh suppression drops from from air on some of the vineyard and so we had to go in and re, uh, reset what blocks we were going to pull from because some of our blocks, because of their situation, uh, were burned or had uh, FOS check or uh, fire, depress fire suppressant damage. And we were really, really happy with the blocks we were able to move to. And that was one of the high points of the whole year for David and I to be able to go and 
pick our new blocks uh, and have it come out so good. And we both said to one another, what were we doing all these years by not being in these blocks? <laughs> because this was, um, like I said, this is gonna be probably the best John Sebastiano uh, that we've made. Yeah. So um, Scott, before we leave Pinos, uh, Scott's got a good question here. Um, do you do whole cluster Pinos, Billy? Uh, a little bit here and there. Uh, probably more from uh, Santa Rita than we would from Santa Maria. Uh, and yes, we've done up to probably 20% whole cluster on things like our block, uh, our swan clone block at Long Cantata and our swan clone block at John Sebastiano and a little bit off of Faciega. Uh, but yes, we, we will in certain years use some whole cluster. But for the most part, we're, uh, we're whole berry to stem. Okay. And, uh, if, and you will, if we do whole cluster, and you will know that in anything we release by the tasting notes, we'll note that it is some full whole cluster uh, fermentation. All right. Okay. Uh, should we move on to our Los Petreros Cabernet Sauvignon? Okay, so Los Petreros is a proprietary name that we have for uh, Cabernet from Happy Canyon. And the literal translation of Los Petreros is the high mesas. Uh, and this wine, the 2016, and, and by the way, the 2016 vintage, I call the sigh of relief vintage or the sigh of relief growing season, because it was the first year post drought, uh, we had normal rainfall and the vines were just so happy to kind of be getting back to normal. And uh, they were, yeah, so the vines were happy because uh, 13, 14 and 15 were tough on, on vines everywhere. Uh, yeah, so 16 sigh of relief. Uh, this wine is kind of equal parts starling vineyard, uh, which is Happen kind of the deepest vineyard into almost the wilderness uh, of Happy Canyon. And then Grimm's Bluff, which sits on this high mesa above the San Inez River and is almost on the outside of the Happy Canyon AVA. Uh, and probably Grimm's is the warmest. Well, these are probably comparable for uh, warmth, but these two vineyards are probably the on the kind of uh, outsiders as far as what's normal in Happy Canyon. Uh, Star Lane would be the last to see any fog in the morning or the first to see it go as well as uh, Grimm's Bluff would be kind of the last to see any fog come in or the last, the first to see it go in the morning. Uh, less wind, uh, both of these, especially Starling, uh, there's a little keyhole uh, where Starling uh, is, and so they don't get a lot of wind up there. And Starling planted in, Ooh, I think 68, and then Grimm's Bluff, relatively young vineyard, but uh, farmed meticulously by Rick Grimm and his team, and uh, very uh, minimal yields off this vineyard. And this is one, two, three, four different Cabernet clones. Mm. So I. Altitude, I just can't go ahead, Jenny. Is the altitude about the same? Because um, I know Deerberg's of uh, the Star Lane's on a pretty steep slope there. 
Um, our 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 block is uh, so probably. God, I'd want to say maybe uh, a thousand feet. Yeah, I mean, in Grimm's Bluff, you're on literally on that tall bluff. With yeah, you are. Uh, they're both beautiful sites. Uh, it's fun. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be. Uh, it won't be the same wine every vintage, uh, the same vineyards. It's just uh, try to make a wine from the, from the elevated mix. Oh, that, that got Tembo started. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this, you know, this wine uh, uh, is actually almost two years in barrel or elevage and uh, it, it needs that. But this 16, I was really surprised at how, how soft and youthful the tannins are. Uh, so it's, it's very lush, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to some cold weather where we can start cooking inside again yeah. and doing some uh, roasts and things in the oven. Is that, an, is that an EMT in the background? EMT. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> His, uh, yep. Um, okay, so uh, a good question here from Steve. And um, I know I would, if I were serving this um, in the next few months or the holidays, um, I would probably decant it. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh, Enjoy your preference, uh, whatever you like. Uh, it will it will help it out. Uh, it's it's a it's pretty young. Uh, it's been in bottle for two years now, uh, so it's just starting to come on. Um, uh, so there's another good question here asking about are all our grapes um, hand harvested? They are, uh, as of. Uh, as of 2020, uh, I think we in 20, oh, I don't know what year it was, we experimented with some Pinot Noir machine harvested just to kind of get a little bit of a grasp of it as to, mm -hmm. because, you know, we can't, we're not going to be able to rely on all these, this hand labor forever. And I just thought it'd be a good idea to take some machine harvested want, uh, fruit and, uh, see what it's all about and see what kind of condition it comes into the winery and and see what the outcome was on the end and it 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 was fine uh but it's just it's not very romantic <laughs> to to get this fruit that's all picked and it's got a, you know a lot of matchsticks in it which are petioles uh not that that does anything but it's just it's so much more enjoyable to look at each cluster and as it goes up the elevator and and check it out and stuff the fruit's cleaner when it comes in so a really good question kind of um a different tact here um what do you think is optimal to hold our cabernet oh yeah that's, i'd that's say uh a 10-year window is really good, but if you went 20, I don't think it would be an issue. I think it would be fine. I just got a note from somebody that um, had our 89 Cabernet, and he swore it was fabulous, that it that it, he, when he first opened it, it had a lot of funk, and, and they let it sit there for a bit, and he said they were, they were just blown away. Um, but you know, certainly, I think conservatively, ten years is kind of ten years is a good window. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And of these, uh, Catherine is asking, heading into the holidays, which are our particular wines that we would call out as being great picks for Thanksgiving? Oh, the Solomon Hills uh, Pinot Noir would be okay. awesome. That's it's it's elegant. It's light. It's it's gonna be all over the Thanksgiving table. 
yeah, everything that goes with that. Uh, yeah, I think with the little... Um, and, and, and then the Chinese food the next day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's good. So, so Billy, um, are the barrels that we use for our cabinet, um, what's the difference between how we treat the pinots in barrel versus the, the red Bordeaux? Uh, they're not toasted as much. The Bordeaux barrels are not as much of a toast as uh, uh, is our Pinot barrels, uh, and they're, the one thing about the Bordeaux barrels is we get thin staves, so the stave, the stave thickness is thinner than it would be on a regular Pinot Noir or, or Chardonnay barrel, or these wines we're tasting tonight, and so the, with the thinner staves, the wine in barrel oxidizes a little more readily, so it uh, it smooths out a little more rapidly than uh, normal. All right, well that's good. Uh, and Mickey's commenting here that he opened the cab two days ago uh, with an hour decant and enjoyed it with a steak, and it was outstanding. Yeah, I I'm all over uh, a fatty cut of red meat with this like ribeye. Uh, yeah. Something with some little New York with some uh, nice caramel caramelized fat on the yeah back. something uh, something fat fatty and prime uh, mm -hmm. would be awesome yeah um, okay so a question from Doug White here Vogelzang seems to produce great fruit from a number of varietals um, yes my, my favorite is your Merlot from Vogelzang. And is that made in such small quantities? It's only available at the winery. It is uh, vintage to vintage. I think the last Merlot we made off of Ogasang was, oh, I guess say maybe fourteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a delicious wine, and I wish we could make it more as more. a as a varietal. Uh, well, right going into the to the our range our bordeaux blend it does go into the range and it does go into the volpino and it yeah. does go into the pajarito uh and uh but it, it would really be nice to for us to have it available all the time uh it's a beautiful beautiful wine and it's probably one of the most food friendly uh of our happy canyon wines of anything uh, yeah, it's just great. great and another thing about the 2020 vintage is our Vogelzang Merlot we did two picks and it's just phenomenal uh, the Merlot this year yeah yeah really happy um, so Mickey has a good question here and asking about our past foothills reserve and that's, we just, we changed the name to, um, it's the Range 30 West. Range 30 West, right. Yeah. Uh, the name change, really. I we mean, so we called it Foothills Reserve, and then we uh, changed it a couple of times to, I think there was an Alegria in there, and uh, yeah. we got a cease and desist on that uh, mm -hmm. from some guy that really pissed Dick off. <laughs> <laughs> some lawyer up in napa anyway uh we settled on range 30 west because that's the actual u.s uh gs coordinates for what is happy canyon so yeah. it was a nice little proprietary name that we trademarked we don't make much range and i don't even think we've made enough to go into a club shipment in the last couple of years so it's always a special oh i i think we have it's been, a, it's been yeah. a little while. Um, yeah. There just hasn't been very much of it. Right. We, would, we would love to make more. Um, and yeah, um, just want to make sure I got all the questions answered here. 
Oh, another one here from Michael. Oh, Michael Doherty. Um, okay, Michael and Meg from Cool, Massachusetts. We love your pianos and adore your uh, Jean Marie drinking a 13 right now by a log fire. Whoa. We've, that sounds wonderful. We've been in jealous, a, jealous, jealous. So hot. We've been so hot here. We love your Foothills Reserve and the Range 30 West. Okay. Thank you guys. Yeah, we would. I'm looking so forward to some fall weather here. I'm I'm over the heat thing. Right. Well, Willie, Billy, what's on the forecast here in the next? Because uh, you're always looking at cooling down. Cooling down. 80s. 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Which is better than the 80s, which is better than the hundreds. Yeah. So, uh, 80s and, and uh, actually we're gonna get into some 40s here in the night. So yeah. Oh, okay. So I'm being reminded here the 17 range 30 west should be coming in the December uh shipment. So that's great. Awesome. And we may we may new do another tasting like this with those with that December offering. Uh, yeah. So everybody, please let us know what you think of this tasting and we could do it. We could easily, it's fun for us um, to do these. We miss you all. I uh, wish we could see you, you I, all more often, but. Um, I'd like to say that uh, this shipment is a great, great example of what we do best. Yeah. Uh, it's a great white, it's a great Pinot and it's a great Bordeaux and it's a it's just an awesome shipment and uh yeah i'm so happy that we included the chardonnay in here because it's it could be uh could be one of the best yeah, yeah. well you know one of our uh, thanksgiving traditions in this household is we have to make deviled eggs for appetizers and the 10 o'clock chardonnay is going to be great with that um <laughs> And and I agree with you, Billy. This I think the Solomon Hills will be on our uh, turkey table. Yeah. Uh, I just I want to add before I forget, but just a reminder um, that for the club wines, what we'll do is for club members, if you reorder any of these three wines, there's there's an additional five percent discount uh, through the end of this month. So it's a good time to stock up. All right. All right. Well, stay safe, stay well, and uh, hopefully don't we'll say any scores. Don't say any scores because some people are are recording. So Dick is is going to be. Quiet. I think everybody knows by now. No. No. no, no, they, no. <laughs> they won't. He's he's dying to say it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you all, and Dick will be back in good form um, to to cope. He'll be off his Percocet. Um, uh, for the next tasting, so. <laughs> so we we'll love you. We love you all. <laughs> we love you all. Thank you all. We really appreciate you, and um, we'll see you hopefully at the winery or at the next virtual tasting. So thank you for joining us. Take care.